I think coherence is so important and I use gratitude because it's the most influential, impactful thing you can do in your life. Coherence means remembering to do it and actually doing it. Um, it takes 0.1 seconds, by the way, to say thank you and it's free. The only common denominator of happiness, no matter how rich or poor, healthy or unhealthy, tall or short, no matter what, what it is, there's only one common denominator of happiness, gratitude. And you can be poor and happy, and you can be rich and happy if you're grateful. And so that's why I have a 14-day gratitude challenge. I challenge everyone for 14 days to be thankful. I guarantee it changes their life. I give gifts to people that you know do the challenge and succeed. I literally am on a mission to have people say thank you. My mom, her greatest gift to me is that she made me say thank you every night. This programming change my life. This programming of gratitude is what I try to enrich other people to do as well. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you like and comment below. And to find future episodes in your feed and push notifications, make sure you subscribe. And if you click the little bell, you'll get every new episode as it's released. Thanks again for watching. I interview high achievers on my show to discover and understand the most common denominators amongst them that may have led to their successes. Today's guest is the former CEO of the legendary Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment Agency, which was the inspiration for the movie Jerry Maguire. He has been recognized by Variety Magazine as the Sports Humanitarian of the Year. He was awarded the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. He is the executive producer of the Bloomberg and Amazon Prime television series Two Minute Drill and Office Hours and he is the co-founder and CEO of Sports One Marketing, which is arguably the most notable sports marketing firm in the world. I ran across a TED Talk that he gave on happiness, and then I went down a rabbit hole on YouTube watching several keynote speeches that he gave on related subjects. Like myself, today's guest comes from very humble beginnings. He pulled himself up to become a multimillionaire earning over $100 million before losing it all. And he later made it all back but what he found after becoming a multimillionaire, losing it all and making it all back was that having and not having money had nothing to do with his happiness. Today, my guest, David Meltzer, will explain his journey to becoming a multimillionaire, what motivated him, and how that indirectly led him to finding happiness, and how any of us can do the same. David's life mission is now to empower over a billion people to be happy. This simple yet powerful mission has led him on an incredible journey that he's going to share to provide one thing, value. Because whether you're rich or poor, happiness is what sets you free, not the money. So let's dive in with the one and only David Meltzer. Hey guys, I'm gonna take a quick pause to introduce the first sponsor on The Jay Gould Show. I am happy and proud to say that this show is now sponsored by Witham Smith & Brown, which is a forward-thinking, technology-driven advisory and accounting firm that is committed to helping big and small companies be more profitable, efficient, and productive in today's complex business environment. Witham now also has a dedicated crypto and blockchain technology team to help early-stage businesses properly navigate all the crypto tax-related matters. I've been using Witham both personally and professionally for nearly a decade for all of my business's personal needs as well. I'm very happy with them and I highly recommend Witham. You can contact Witham by visiting their website at Witham.com. Now back to the show. Dave, welcome to the show. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be here because this is the topic of all topics. It's the reason that I live to empower over a billion people to be happy. My understanding of happiness and being able to discuss it with someone like you is to me the best way to spend a day. Dave, like I said in the intro, I ran across a TED talk that you gave on the happiness that we're about to talk about. And your story was very familiar and similar to my story. In 2004, I created the first video sharing in bed site before YouTube was around. I sold it in 2005 to a company in New York. And what happened was a few years later, YouTube sold for $1.65 billion. So what we did, like many entrepreneurs in the internet days, and we'll talk about your journey too, is I looked at their purchase price. I extrapolated the number of users they had on Comscore. I got a number per user, multiplied it times our users. And on paper, I'm like worth $100 million as we're going to talk about your journey. So I had it all. But then one week from the acquisition date that Google acquired YouTube, Universal Music issued us a lawsuit. They sued us, MySpace, and Sony all in the same day. And within a year, we had to file bankruptcy. So I had 100 million, 
And then poof, I went bankrupt a year later and had nothing. Um, so it kind of resonated with me that with, with me about your story about have, making that kind of money. Um, mine was more paper wealth. You actually had the money, right? But but still having that kind of wealth, right? And then you think it's going to derive all this happiness to you in life, and it doesn't. And then a few years later, I started another ad tech company. Actually, sold that one for. $33 million in cash. That one didn't go away. <laughs> okay. So that was a nice, you know, recovery like you had. Um, but what I found very similar to you is that the happiness that I had in life has nothing to do with any of the money that I ever made. And my story and my show that I always tell people, I'm trying to teach people the mindset to becoming wealthy, the mindset to becoming a great entrepreneur. And, and we'll talk about that in all these other shows, but in this show, I want to talk about happiness. But before we start there, Dave, what I want you to do is I want to go all the way back to your childhood. Bring us back to little Dave. Tell us about what was the desire to wanting you to the, the, the desire that you had that created the desire, I should say, for you becoming wealthy yourself. So what was that as a kid that made you want to become wealthy? You know, I have uh, analyzed this so many times because money plays a, such an integral role in my journey to understanding happiness. And when I was five years old, my dad left. My mom single second grade teacher, uh, six kids, five boys and a girl. I'm a middle, middle, low end of that. And, you know, my mom had one goal that was to empower her children through education, right? The fetus wasn't fully developed till after graduate school. Her favorite line was doctor, lawyer, or failure. <laughs> Unlike my siblings who adhered to my mom's wishes and all ended up in the Ivy League schools with full scholarships and graduated summa cum laude from Harvard, Penn, and Columbia, I just wanted to be rich. Uh, and the reason I wanted to be rich is I was living in a two bedroom apartment with six kids. My mom worked two jobs so she could educate us. Two jobs. Second grade teacher came home, made our dinner, packed it into a paper bag, and we filled up turnstiles at convenience stores with greeting cards just so we could eat. Sometimes with green, uh, food stamps, and people may not even know what those are. And I would, in that car, as my siblings were studying and supposedly reading to me, I'd tell them to shut the F up that I was going to be rich and I didn't need to study because I was going to buy my mom a house and a car. I say the story and still get choked up because my mom lived with these values that changed my life eventually, that helped me understand the lessons and the journey of being poor. I call that period of my life the world of not enough. I lived as a victim. Everything happened to me. I always would say, why do those people have this? They have a dad, a house, a car. And my journey was always directed to money was the only missing element of happiness in my life. It wasn't that I was unhappy. In fact, looking back, I'm 53 years old. Some of the happiest times I had was with my mom mm -hmm. and my siblings broke as shit uh, living in gratitude and forgiveness, accountability and inspiration, wanting and pursuing in a consistent, persistent manner, that happiness that I had. But moreover, I was directed at the time. You asked me from the time I was five until the time I was 30, does money buy happiness? I would tell you absolutely, no doubt. And I, I will tell you the reason why too. Only time I wasn't happy is when I'd catch my mom crying because of financial stress. Mm -hmm. Car breaks down, kids that grew up with nothing. In fact, when I do speeches around the world, one of my first things I ask, who here grew up poor? Half the, half the audience raises their hand. I say, I feel sorry for the rest of you because I can't even teach my own kids what I learned from the time I was five until my first million dollars at 24. Uh, I can't teach them what I went through, uh, but I try to let them understand the relativity of money, which is a currency, an object of energy that you put into the flow to get what you want. You know, it's funny you say that. I have a bunch of friends from the tech world that made a bunch of money. And the thing that they all say too is they worry about their kids because we had this grit that was developed. You know, Angela Duckworth's book, The Grit, right? And we all kind of developed this grit. And most of the people I know that came from nothing, by the way, most people don't realize this for the audience that doesn't know, 85% of millionaires are first generation millionaires. It's not like there's this inheritance that's going around for all the wealthy people, right? And it's usually because it's born out of this desire that Dave and myself and others have had that we, we want something that we didn't have. We think this is going to solve our not being happy or whatever those problems are in life. But you find out once you get the money, it actually doesn't solve that. And by the way, one added statistic, over half of the millionaires in, the, in America go bankrupt at least twice. 
And I did. <laughs> At least once. I hopefully it doesn't happen yeah. twice. <laughs> no, no, me neither. I went once. I'm with you, brother. <laughs> yeah. Um, can we talk about the journey? Because I, I, you have some similarities. Me to dot com and you know world. You, you were in the early '90s in the dot com world. So why don't you tell us how you got your first million dollars? How did you earn the first million? Yeah, well, first I tried to follow my mom's recommendation, doctor, lawyer, failure. And I have to mention my story about being a doctor because originally I wanted to be a professional football player, got ran over by Christian Okoye in college, wow. my first play <laughs> freshman year. And I remember lying on my back going, doctor, lawyer, failure. So I was going to be pre-med. I went to visit my older brother who was a doctor. And the first words out of my mouth, because this is a great lesson. I said, man, I hate hospitals. I was 18 years old, a freshman pre-med in college. And my brother said to me, Dave, what do you mean you hate hospitals? You're pre-med. God knows you're not going to be a professional football player. You're pre-med. What do you mean you hate hospitals? I said, well, I'm not going to be a hospital doctor. I was 18 years old. I'm going to be a sports doctor. I'll be on the sidelines and locker rooms. I don't need to be in a hospital. And he shook his head in disbelief. But he gave me the best advice of my entrepreneurial life. He said, David, you need to be more interested than interesting. And that lesson to me has carried me so far in my life because I was an interesting dude for a long time. Mm -hmm. And when I became interested with an open mind and open heart and open hands, when I became interested to learn things, to do my best and to have fun, my life changed. So uh, I went to be a lawyer, this time very calculated to make money. I went to a law school where they had the highest paying graduates in oil and gas litigation, the highest paying job. And when I graduated, I had two job offers, one to be an oil and gas litigator, paid about 150,000 salary plus bonuses at 24. And then I also, in 1992, I got a sales job in the internet. In 1992, DOS, 9,600 bow modems, $250,000 comp plan. And so I asked my mom, who you know I adore, I said, what should I do, mom? What job should I take? Without blinking, she tells me, you got to be a real lawyer. This internet <laughs> thing's a fad. It's never going to work. You're going to lose everything. Nine months later, I'm a millionaire. I took the internet job. Three years later, we sold the company for $3.4 billion to Thomson wow. Reuters in 1995. $3.4 billion in 1995. I then re-engineer myself to the Silicon Valley to work in the wireless proxy server space. By the time I'm 30, I'm CEO of Samsung's phone division, the first smartphone. They didn't even, 1999, they didn't call them smartphones. They called them convergence devices. <laughs> and it was a Windows, Windows C device. So I was around you know, Jobs, I was around Gates, I was around Googs, I was around all the biggest names, Dell. You know, As a young executive, uh, and if somebody would have asked me from the time I was 24 to the time I was 30, does money buy you love and happiness? I would have told them, absolutely. <laughs> There's no doubt that money buys me happiness and love. This is the end all be all. I want to make as much money as I can to buy myself happiness. This part of my life is not just enough. I mean, sorry, it's not not enough like when I grew up. This is the part of my life I call the just enough. Yes. Right? I had just just enough to negotiate trade. Money to me took on a different role. It was one of negotiation of quid pro quo. I did everything to get something back, including giving, right? The more you give, the more you receive. So when I gave, it was to get something back. There was a condition yeah. and a judgment. And I thought I was happy because I was buying things I didn't need to impress people I didn't even like. And if I wasn't happy, I'd buy more things, different things. I, you know, impress different people. But in the end, I had to learn a lesson in order to facilitate what happiness really meant. You, so there's a few things here. You got a lot there. So there's a couple of things I want to unpack, right? The one thing I heard you say this in other interviews, um, lesson learned from that with your mother. And this is interesting because I have the same thing with my stepfather and other people in my life is that just because someone loves you doesn't mean that the advice that they give you is good advice. And that's not intentional, right? It's not like they're no. intentionally giving you bad advice. It's that they love you and they care for you. And a lot of times they're risk averse and they tell you to do things that they think are, you know, less risky, but what they don't realize is they don't, they don't understand, they don't know what they don't know. There's three types of knowledge, the things you know, you know, the things you know, you don't know. And then the things you don't know, you don't know. And the people that love you, sometimes they're just trying to protect you and they give you bad advice. And you were smart enough to not listen to that advice at, the at that point. 
yeah, I call it two types of people, ignorant people and ignorant people. Uh, there's ignorant, arrogant people, which isn't just people that lie to us, manipulate us and cheat us. This the people who love us most, like my mom, that to protect us, pretend like they really know about business or about school or about other things and they ruin our lives. Uh, so you got to find someone uh, in ignorant humility that doesn't know what they don't know, or someone that sits in the situation that you want to be in. The, the people, like you said, that actually, I now have mentors all the time in my life that know about that specific thing. In fact, my mom is still my family mentor. Like, yeah. I want to be a better parent. Best parent I ever met is my mom, second grade teacher, commu- you know, Sunday school teacher, community leader in education, a, a mom who raised six kids on her own. She knows a little bit about that. She knows nothing still today about the internet, about football, you know, <laughs> none of that stuff. Hundred um, percent. Same thing. Like with my parents, you know, I would come to them with a big idea that I have, and they would just like rip it apart and tell me all the things that would not work about it. But th- again, it's coming from love, and it's coming from, a, and I recognized that. I was also fortunate enough that I grew up next door to my grandparents, and my grandfather, he had that ignorant humility that you're talking about. He would say, "Jay, I don't know what you're talking about, but you know, you should." Look. I, I remember talking to him when I was in college, and I was like, "I want to be rich someday, and I want to become wealthy." And and he, and I'll never forget it. He was a carpenter, and he says, "You're asking a carpenter how to do electrical work. I can't help you. You got to talk to people that have, have made money." And I said, I don't know anybody's made any money. We grew up in a blue collar town. I was like, I don't. And he goes, well, they all write books. Go, go, go to the library and get their books. And that's what I did. And I, and I tried to read and consume. And then the internet obviously was pretty popular. So I started looking online. And these kids don't know how good they have it today with all the podcasts like this and others that you do. They get to you know learn the way you think. They could probably end your sentences for crying out loud. We didn't have that benefit 25 years ago. That, that wasn't the case. You know? I, I, w- I will tell you, my grandfather had a great impact on me as well. And I just admire... Uh, the simple advice, right? And I want to unpack what you say for everyone out there because it's so important, right? You're asking a contractor about electrical work, number one, but two, people like that write books, go read their books. That, that talk about wisdom, yes. right? And it doesn't have to be books anymore. Find the podcast, the books, the, the videos, whatever it is, people like that, meaning people in the situation you want to be in, are sharing the secrets. You don't have to pay the dummy tax. And that's my motivation and inspiration for being here today, to share the dummy tax that you and I have both paid in order to facilitate making it easier for other people to get to where we are by giving them directions. You know, and the other thing is I, I talk to a lot of people on the show and I talk about the different commonalities amongst them, as I said earlier. And I, one thing I found is that the wealthier the individuals have been, the more humbled they are by their successes. They've realized they've been pretty lucky too. An element of this is luck. It's hard work, but there's a lot of luck. Timing is a big part of the outcome. You're going to have a great outcome either way if you work really hard, diligently plan, and you're persistent at it. And by the way, you have another line in here, if you don't mind, if I wanted to read this, um, if I can find it. It was your definition of happiness. To enjoy the consistent every day, persistent without quit, pursuit of your potential. Not what other people want for you, not what's missing or you don't want. But what you want, knowing what, who, how, now, and applying your why will bring you happiness. Yes, exactly. You know, and that's the that's the key. So I want to I want to go over one other thing. You said this was a cool one. I saw this talk, and my I told it to my wife because I was preparing for the interview, and I, and I always talk to her about the interviews that I'm doing. And I said he has this thing where he says you should say thank you every night when you go to bed, and say thank you every morning when you wake up. So we did it last night. And we forgot this morning. <laughs> you said in your yeah. talk, everybody raise your hand. Will you do it? And 50% exactly. of you will go home and forget. And the other 50% will forget in the morning. We woke up in the morning. We weren't. She got up before me and I was like, oh, we didn't get to do it already. Um, but we're going to try this for 30 days. And why don't you tell everybody about the thank you? Uh, uh, yeah. So I, I think coherence is so important. And I use gratitude because it's the most influential, impactful thing you can do in your life. You know, I have studied physics, quantum physics, and metaphysics. I have surrounded myself. I'm on the Transformational Leadership Council, Deepak Chopra, Jack Canfield, Bob Proctor, John Asaroff, Sharon Lett, the greatest minds in the world, Oprah Winfrey, whether you think she's a great mind or not, they all believe in gratitude. In fact, this is so related to happiness. Why gratitude so important in the coherence of gratitude? Coherence means remembering to do it and actually doing it. That's what happened to you and your wife. You, you haven't learned coherence yet, but you will. Um, it takes 0.1 seconds, by the way, to say thank you and it's free. It takes 0.1 seconds. But the amazing thing about gratitude, listen to this. The only common denominator of happiness, 
No matter how rich or poor, healthy or unhealthy, tall or short, religious belief, sexual preference, uh, spirituality, no matter what, what it is, there's only one common denominator of happiness, gratitude. Gratitude's the only common denominator and you can be poor and happy and you can be rich and happy if you're grateful. And so that's why I have a 14 day gratitude challenge. I challenge everyone for 14 days to be thankful. I guarantee it changes their life. I give gifts to people that you know do the challenge and succeed. I literally am on a mission to have people say thank you. My mom, her greatest gift to me is that she made me say thank you every night and if I, cause I didn't know coherence, if I came down with an ungracious attitude, she would send me back upstairs <laughs> to put my knees on the ground, look up to the sky and list out all the things I'm grateful for and then come back down with a new attitude. This programming changed my life. This programming of gratitude is what I try to enrich other people to do as well. I say all the time too, um, that uh, I'm, I'm with you 100% on this because I think a lot of people worry about what's going to happen in the future and they complain about the things that happened in the past and they're not living in the present. My head coach in football, when I was in high school, I played football in high school, and um, he used to say, be where your feet are. Be where yeah. your feet are. Enjoy the moment, right? Don't worry about things that haven't happened because you don't have no idea what's going to happen. And the past is the past. Leave it there. Just live here right now. It doesn't mean don't plan for the future. It just means that you can't worry about what the outcomes will be later. And uh, a lot of people have problems with this. And it, and I think causes a lot of them their unhappiness because they're just worrying and complaining a lot. Yeah. And both of those worrying and complaining, they're duplicative in the damage that they do for you because both, right, complaining, putting judgments and conditions, stumbling over the road bumps behind us, and especially worrying, not only, not only does it uh, interfere with what you already are, right? You're happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy. You got to figure out what you're doing to interfere with it. Worrying and complaining interfere with your potential. But how about this? They actually both have a duplicative negativity in the fact that if you worry or complain, you're manifesting what you don't want. See, when you start complaining about something that's happened, you're actually putting attention and intention on a coincidence of the same thing happening again. If you worry about something in the future, you're making the statistical chance of it happening far greater. So for example, when I was in law school, there's this thing called the rules of perpetuity. And I used to, when I, my exam, I, oh man, I hope this isn't on my exam. Then when I took the bar, hope it's not on the bar. You know what the first question on the bar exam was to me? Rule goddamn perpetuity. If I would have taken all the time, in fact, I got to tell this story. I went back and because that rules of perpetuity, I got so far in my own way when I was like 40 some years old and I was in my journey, I said, I'm going to learn the rules of perpetuity and see how long it takes me because I worried over years about the rule of perpetuity, hours and hours of interference of time, emotion, value, and money. It took me 15 minutes with a clear head, a clear heart, and clear hands to learn the rules of perpetuity. I promise you that I worried for over 15 hours that Incredible. I never could learn it because I was worrying about it being on the exam instead of actually learning it. It's incredible. Like there's, there's no, it's wasted energy to worry about things that haven't happened yet, but we all do it. Everybody's guilty of it. You have to make a conscious effort. Yeah. Spend minutes and moments. Know that you're going to do it. Just spend minutes and moments instead of days, weeks, months, and years. Yeah. We're all going to do it. I mean, it's just human nature. Unfortunately, it's kind of embedded in the DNA. We were worried about tigers and stuff. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. It's the ego. We're, we're protecting our limitations. We're protecting our embodiment. That's another thing my grandfather used to say. He's like, do a, try to do a good job of balancing your ego, your pride, and you, your humility, right? He's like, and in every instance, sometimes you have to outweigh, you need more pride. You need a little more humility in some cases. Sometimes you need less humility and you need more ego, right? But it's not like you always have to be even keel. You have to learn how to lever that and, and use it to your advantage in those situations. But a lot of people, I think they either over, overweight on one or the other. They're either too humble and shy and passive or they're too egocentric and they just can't get past their own head. You know, Your grandfather was a wise old soul, by the way. I'd love to have met him. He really was. He lived to 95. He was a great man. Mine lived to 97, so I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, tell us though, help, help us. I, I think you said that your mother gave you the tools to becoming happy, which you've mentioned a couple times in passing, gratitude, empathy, accountability. You interchanged inspiration and effective communication a couple of times in some of the speeches. So tell me the differences between all these. And is this the key to becoming happy? 
Yeah. So in the thoughtful world, being grateful gives you perspective. It allows you to find the light, the love and the lessons and everything. You just have to determine on the great chain of feeding how much energy you want to put into the things. Because most people spend 80% of their time on things that bleed them. It's just a natural attraction that we have to things that bleed us. And I try to shift people's paradigm or perspective to put your energy and resources into that which feeds you so it will feed you and you can feed it. So gratitude gives you that perspective. It makes pain, mistakes, failures, setbacks, an indicator that you have a better place to be, a, a better uh, position or situation to be in. Secondly, a, uh, empathy is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And if you are expanding, growing, and accelerating, you're going to make tons of mistakes. I tell people all the time, I look for people that are fast learners because I want them making a ton of mistakes, but learning quickly from them, advancing and changing their trajectory to a better place, a better position, or putting themselves in a better situation. The third is powerful. Accountability gives us control. So the accountability is what did I do to attract this to myself? It's not liability, not blame, shame, and justification, but what did I do to attract this to myself? And what am I supposed to learn from it? Because life is about lessons. The lessons will keep on coming until we learn them. Pain will indicate we, we have a lesson to learn, mistakes, failures, and setbacks. Now, the last one, you said I interchange effective communication mm -hmm. and inspiration. And that's because my relationship to faith has evolved. See, when I first created and lost everything and, and sat, as my wife told me she was leaving me and I hated her and hated my best friend, hated my parents, and I realized I hated myself. I spent a day figuring out these four different values that I was going to live by. It came up effective communication that I was going to learn to effectively communicate with my mom, my dad, my wife, and my best friends. But what it's turned into is that that communication comes through me, meaning my life changed when I truly believe, and I spend minutes and moments outside of this belief, but my general belief day by day is that there's something bigger than me that loves me more than I love my children. And because I have faith in that, I am effectively communicating with the omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing source. And I learn to appreciate it, which adds value, expands me. I learn to acknowledge it by giving it away, acquiring the knowledge of what I have by losing it, giving it away, having it cheated from me, stolen from me. That's all acknowledgement. It's an investment in myself. It's an acquired knowledge. But then you talked about these varying degrees that your grandfather talked about. I asked for more. Receiving's just as important. So for me, effective communication is a duality of effectively communicating with the all-knowing, all-powerful. Why is that so important? Because, and I'm going to give you a story. My mom, who's not omniscient, we agree upon that. She's not all-knowing, but she loves me way more than she should. She's ignorant, arrogant in her love for me because sure. she would rather cut off a finger than have me have a fingernail tear. You know what I mean? Like that's the way she is. Uh, and it's hurt her in her life because she's never asked for more. But my mom believes that. So when I was three years old, my mom's the most gentle soul. She still talks to me like a second grade teacher. So sweet. I went to put my hand on the stove and my mom slapped the shit out of my hand and screamed at me. No, I started to cry, cry. Mom, why are you punishing? What did I do? Why are you punishing me? And she put her arms around me and said, I'm not punishing you. I'm protecting you, right? Because my mom knew what the stove would do to me. The same way that God, omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing, whatever you believe in, this higher source, when it provides pain, when it slaps you on the hand and says, bankrupt this company, you don't want to marry this person, divorce, or here's an illness. When, when God, when, when the universe brings this to you, whatever you believe in, source, you're not being punished. You're being protected and promoted. And it's going to take gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and inspiration in order you to facilitate the first $30 million sale. Or my, it took me two weeks to make my first million dollars back after losing over $100 million. That's all. I was promoted and protected. And the more that I live in this space of inspiration, of appreciating everything that I have to add value, acknowledging it and asking for more to fill the biggest vessel. And I will tell you, a lot of people, you talked about a lot of people 
you know, just live in one of those areas. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what happened to my mom. My mom's 80 years old, totally appreciates everything she ever had. She acknowledged everything. She gave away everything, but she never asked for more. So although she would expand slowly, but surely her vessel dissipated and dissolved to where she's 80 years old and she's given away her health. She's given away her wealth. And she is in a position where she actually is doing what she doesn't want to do, which is relying on her children to support her, right? Reli yes. All because of her kindness, all because she gave it all away and didn't feel worthy of asking for more. She thought there was something wrong with receiving. I'm here to tell you, it's just as important to ask for more than it is to give more because you can't give what you don't have. And the greatest flow you can create is to receive, appreciate, acknowledge, and receive more. Dave, tell us, you, you've spoken to us before we jumped on the recording. Um, you made a ton of money in the, the dot-com boom, right? And then you lost it. How did you lose it? And you talked about quickly how you just made some money back. We'll get back to that too. But like, it's amazing. Like I, I myself and a bunch of people I know in the dot-com world, this was a common thing. I know that's not how yours was, but like you could evaporate very quickly with a lawsuit or something could happen, right? How did you lose the $100 million that you've made? Like, how did that happen? Yeah. So it, ignorant arrogance, you know, I thought that I was Midas. I thought I knew everything. I never asked for any help. And so what happened was, uh, I had a golf course, a ski mountain, 33 homes, all bought correctly. So even though 2008, that wasn't going to hurt me. What hurt me was that I got into a lawsuit with a neighbor because I bought a condo conversion for millions of dollars from him. Okay. I let my ego get in the way to prove that I was right. I went through my first $5 million in cash to prove that I was right, thinking I could go to my private bank and get another $40 million cash off of the equity I had in the properties that I owned. But the bank was going under. Yeah. I had no idea in my ignorant arrogance that a bank would say no to me. And then when you own that much stuff, someone says no to you and you got to go look for more money. And people now that don't have a relationship to you are asking like, Hey, why do you need the money? Oh, my bank won't give me the money. Well, let me see why, why your bank's not going to give you the money. Meanwhile, those bills keep piling up and I got legal bills and I end up in a malpractice lawsuit for the lawyer that screwed up my lawsuit. In the end, you can lose over a hundred million dollars very quickly. It took me about two years to lose it all. Uh, but the good news is people ask me where my basement is. See, remember, your basement is determined by your skills and knowledge. Your ceiling's determined by your desire. See, so I had a high basement, but my basement was two years before I lost everything because I was emotionally bankrupt because I had to learn that money doesn't buy love or happiness. It just allows you to shop. And I had to learn to shop for the right things for the right reasons in order to be happy. See, the more money you have, if you shop for the right things for the right reasons, you'll be very happy. But I was shopping for the wrong things for the wrong reasons, which left me in a complete void, an emptiness that I never want to experience again. They, um, I have a friend that said, um, happiness doesn't make, I'm sorry, money doesn't make any happier, right? So it doesn't bring any happiness to have money. He goes, but I'd rather be a miserable son of a bitch and rich on a beach. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, actually. If, but you got to figure out how to become happy. To so the things you're talking about here, the gratitude, the empathy, the accountability, these are, it's, it's a mindset. Just like acquiring that wealth is a mindset. Becoming happy is, is, is the mindset. You have to kind of like retrain um, yourself and your thinking. And it's not about the things. I have a lot of wealthy friends that buy like Lamborghinis and, this and that. that shit doesn't make you any happier. It, it, none of that stuff does anything for you. I will tell you my favorite story about a Lambo is a kid that I coach, Tay Sweat, who is a, you know, at risk inner city kid. And I said, Tay, man, why'd you buy that Lambo? You know, I had Ferraris and Lambos and I go, all it did was prove my ego was out of control. You know, he said, no, Dave, I bought it for a different reason than you. I wasn't trying to impress anyone. I said, why'd you buy your Lambo? He said, because when kids like me, ask me if I'm an athlete, a rap star, how I made this money, an entertainer, I look at them and, and I tell them, nope, I read books and teach people. And so for me, I have a particular reason to own this car. And that resonated with me. And that's an example of being able to buy happiness by shopping for the right things. That's interesting. The only thing I really spent a lot of money on was my house. And uh, I remember some family friend come over and um, 
they looked around the house and they were, I think it might've been my grandfather or my aunt or something. And it looked, and it was a beautiful house, 10,000 square feet, beautiful, right? On the water. And they're like, who are you trying to impress with this? Yeah. And I looked at them and I was like, okay, I could, I could understand that, that take. I go, but I, I view it as, as experiences. Like I grew up, we didn't have a lot. We came very, and I was very hum. I was very, um, we had humble beginnings. I was very happy growing up. I, I wasn't ever like, oh, this sucks. I and mean, there was moments in 1990 when there was a recession. My dad was out of work for a year. That kind of, that was an, left an indelible mark on me. But outside of that, it was a very happy childhood. If I wanted a new pair of Air Jordans, mom figured out a way to get it, usually with a credit card or something, right? Like she, she would just put herself yeah. in debt, right? But I always got what I wanted. It wasn't like I didn't, I wasn't without, right? Like they definitely provided for me. And I had a normal childhood. Everybody in town was the same. They're all in debt, you know? Um, but yeah, so like when I built my house, it was so that my kids can grow up and have what I didn't have. They could have an experience as a staycation every day, but I didn't get all the nice cars and the things like that, because that is true. Most of the time, unlike your friend, it is just trying to impress people that you really don't care about. They don't care about you either. It's like, why are you really doing that? You know? And I wanted to buy a Lambo when I sold my company back in 2015 and I called up my buddies who had a Lambo and a few of my friends and, and they were like, don't buy it. It's not worth it. The thing breaks. It's $20,000. <laughs> like it's oil changes are off the charts. It's like, you're going to put a thousand miles a year on it. They break if you don't drive them and they break if you drive them. So you're screwed. They always break. There's no reason we should have a Lamborghini. <laughs> Just rent the damn. Yeah. I have a lot of friends actually rent them. Actually, they do these like weekend trips. I'd rent them too, or borrow them. I like to have. I like to borrow my friend's stuff. I also like the line um, that you said. You you need to live in a world of more than enough. This is the stuff we're kind of talking about now, right? We all have more than we need. When you really think about globally, 7.8 billion people on the planet, we are the, the poorest people in America are doing better than the than the richest people in some parts of this world. Yes. Um, so why don't you tell us more about that line? Because you use it a lot and I really like it. And I think it's really important today because a third of the people on earth, especially in America, are feeling overwhelmed because there's so much opportunity. I always say a third of the people are going to do extremely well. A third of people are going to be stable. A third of people are going to be victims and do shitty, especially because of the pandemic and the yeah. economy. But the overwhelm feeling that so many people have right now is you should be grateful for because it's proof that you're living in the world of more than enough. You got more than enough opportunity, options. You got a prioritization problem. See, prioritization is the antidote to procrastination and overwhelmness. But you should feel blessed if you're overwhelmed. See, in the world of more than enough, you are living between limitlessness and infinity. You're not living in a zero sum game like in the world of just enough. Just enough, it's if I receive, someone else loses. Or if I get, right, it's if I win, someone else, there is no, the, the universe is expanding, growing, it's infinity. So when you ask for more or you live in the world of more than enough, you're just adding on to what already exists. It's already done. There's infinity out there. So what I try to teach people is, hey, be blessed to be overwhelmed. Let me teach you to prioritize in order to effectuate the world of more than enough. I'll tell people all the time, Neville Goddard is someone that I study, right? The law of assumption. It's already there. So let's figure out to clear the interference between you and what you are dreaming of, imagining, manifesting, to get out of its way, to allow it to happen. So I'll say to someone, here, feel what it's like to make over a million dollars. And don't put time on it, by the way. This is where I disagree with Bob Proctor. Well, one of the few places. I am a big resistance person. So the minute you put a time, a date, or an amount, a man-made construct on what you want, you're screwing yourself. Mm -hmm. I Like, for example, if I told you I want to make, you know, a million dollars by the end of the next year, the minute I say that, I'm getting more and more resistance every second that ticks by yeah. that I don't have the million dollars. Creating scarcity, yeah. Exactly. So I always say, look, I want to double the amount of money I make as fast as I can. I, you know, all the things, minimums. I want to live to over 111 years old. My big thing when I was young, I used to tell uh, Diane Cannon, I share my Lakers seats with. She's a famous, she was in Heaven Can Wait. She was married to Cary Grant. Most beautiful 85-year-old woman I've ever met. Anyway, I told her, I want to live to 111. I was born on January 11th at 111. I'm going to die on January 11th at 111 at 111 <laughs> years old. I know it. And she literally almost cried. And I was like, what's the matter? She goes, why are you limiting yourself? She goes, what if by the time you're 100, they have technology that everybody lives to 1,000, and for the next 50 years, you're manifesting dying at 111 because it's a cute number, and instead you've you know, really ruined 889 years of your life. 
People do that all the time. It's they limit themselves. I tell people all the time, the only thing that should die in this lifetime are your limitations, including your body. It's limiting you, right? So think about the only thing that's dying is your limitations. And you're going to live in limitlessness infinity in a world of more than enough, more than enough of everything for everyone to come through you, not to you, not for you, but through you for everyone else, completing the flow of appreciation, acknowledgement, and asking. Um, it reminds me of this. I think Grant Cardone, who was on my show, he was talks about abundance versus scarcity mindset. And um, and, and and I showed my kids this movie, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, right? Um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory with Johnny Depp, right? And uh, in that movie, Charlie comes running in with the golden ticket. He's running down. He goes in, and the grandparents are laying in their bed, and the four grandparents from both sides, right? They're like always in the bed, like they don't ever get out of bed, right? Because they're poor and, and they're, you know old and stuff. And uh, the grandfather jumps out of bed and he starts dancing around and tap dancing. And he's like, we're going to go, Charlie, we're going, we're going. And then Charlie's like, wait a second, we can't go. We're poor. I can sell this. People are asking me on the street. I can sell this. And he goes, come here, Charlie, sit down on the bed. And he looks, in, looks at him and he says, why would you sell this for something as trivial as money? They make more money every day. You could always get more money, but that's an experience that's once in a lifetime. And I always tell my kids this. I go, it's not about the money. It's about the experiences. The money can help provide that for you, but the money itself, it's that's not what life is about. you know. And there's an abundance of opportunities out there to the point that you're saying. And I think a lot of people have the scarcity mindset, like zero sum. You know, That guy got the millions and I can't. He won, someone lost. That's not the case. You just got to provide value. No doubt. And if somebody would have told us when we were young that you could make a trillion dollars, even with an abundant mindset, you and I would have been like, come on, man. In fact, I tell a story uh, about Jeff Bezos. So 25 years ago, I had more money than Bezos. I was more famous than Bezos. I had more relationships in the Silicon Valley than Jeff Bezos. 25 years ago. And if I was at Jeff Bezos' house in his garage and he looked at me and said, Dave, I got this great business. I'm selling books out of my garage, you know, on the internet. And I'm an internet guy, right? I'm an optimist. I may be a optimist, the top of all optimists. <laughs> if he would have said to me, Dave, I'm selling these books on the internet on my garage. Someday I'm going to be the richest man on earth and make a trillion dollars. I will tell you, I would have laughed at him, scoffed at him and made fun of him the same way everyone in my life have laughed at me, scoffed at me and made fun of me. I would have done that to him because I had limitations in my own beliefs and perspective. Thank goodness Jeff Bezos didn't. And that's why Jeff Bezos has a trillion dollars and I don't yet because I had to learn how to shift my mindset into an abundant one of more than enough. And guess what? Just because Jeff Bezos has a trillion dollars doesn't mean I couldn't make back my hundred million dollars like I did. I was, uh, I was at a party with Reed Hoffman in an after party once years ago. He was an investor in one of my companies. And he says, I need you to go over there and talk to this guy over there. His name is Ev Williams. Ev Williams, the founder of Twitter, right? And previously he invented blogging. He did blogger.com, sold it to, to, to Google. And then he had a podcasting site called Odeo. Um, he says he, he just gave all his investors their money back for Odeo, which was this like audio podcasting platform. He thought it was going to go from long form blogging to podcasting. And he says, Odeo is not working out. He's giving the money back. But they have this new idea. This guy, Jack Dorsey, working for him, came up with this idea. They're calling it Twitter, I think. Go go over there and, and, and see what you think of his idea. And it was him, Jeremy Liu from Lightspeed Venture, roll off both of like all these VC guys I was hanging out with. And I was like, all right. And he introduced me. He goes, Bo Bota and Jack are my friends, man. I love Bota. He waves me over. And, and, and so, so, so he, oh, sorry, he waves over Evan. Ev's like, he's like, hey, this is Jay Gould. He's like, I want you to meet him. And he's like, you know, introduce you guys. So we walk away and he starts telling me about Twitter. To your point about the Jeff Bezos thing, I'm listening to this idea and I'm looking at him and I'm like, this doesn't make any sense, you know? And so I, I, I go, because the iPhone wasn't even out yet, right? This is like this, this is like 2006, man, right? And I'm like, um, I don't know about this one, brother. <laughs> like you got the blogging thing right, but you kind of messed up on the last one. This might not be a good idea either. And he's like, what do you mean? I go, I mean, can't I just put all my friends in the contacts and leave in my phone and, and group it that way? And then we can send a text message out as a group text. And he goes, I guess you could. <laughs> and I was like, so then why would you need to do this? He goes, I mean, maybe you don't want to use it. I don't know what to tell you. I walk away and he's like, what do you think? I goes, it's a terrible idea. I wouldn't invest in that. <laughs> $50 billion company, right? <laughs> when I, 1999, I'm on Good Morning America and I have the world's first smartphone, a convergence device. And I tell them that you someday will be able to talk in color, full duplex, which means you can interrupt each other, to China for free. And literally, they're like, like <laughs> I'm, I'm crazy. Like yeah. literally, you know, lock this kid up. He's insane. This will never happen. 
right? And I laugh every time I use my iPhone to contact my friends in Beijing for free, you know, vo voice over IP with the Alex Machinskis of the world. You know, it's just, it's just so beautiful to see the opportunities. I was on the clubhouse, you know, the drop in audio app and Alex was on stage with me and this other guy came at him and started attacking him because he's running Celsius, right? And, and to, to, him, to them, these are Bitcoin guys. I'm a he big a partner of theirs. So he, I put a lot of money in there. Yeah, so 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 these guys start attacking because they call it shit coinery because it's not Bitcoin, it's shit coin. You know how the, the industry is. You know how it is, right? And they're yelling at him and they're shouting him down on a stage. And he's very calm and relaxed, Alex. And I've never met Alex, right? But I Googled him and I'm like, this guy invented voice over IP. So I come off of mute as one of the moderators. And I'm like, guys, I'm going to kick you off the stage. Show a little respect. This guy invented the technology in which you're using to yell at him on. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was like, what are we doing here? We can disagree. We can be reasonable adults and disagree, but come on. <laughs> Eight, eight, eight startups, three unicorns, right? Three, three unicorns. This bank has over $30 billion, but you have people laugh at them, scoff at them and make fun of them because they're scarce and afraid to understand the democratization of finance. And they also are angry because they've been taken advantage of for so many years by our traditional banking institutions, like many other. And I know you do so much in crypto. There's so many opportunities and it leads to one other part of living in a world of more than enough. And it's something I teach in sales. It's something I teach in business. I have, because of the connectivity of the universe today, meaning social media and how big our networks are, I have no avatars anymore in my life. All I do is search for open minds. And I'll tell you why. If I can figure out if you have an open mind, that means you have an open heart and open hands. That means you surround yourself with more people with open minds, open hearts and open hands, like the Alex Machinskis of the world, like the Kim Perels of the world, like the Cindy Eckerts of the world, all my Jack Dorsey of the world, all these great believers. And more importantly, if you have an open mind, now I can determine two things. Are you going to be a sponsor of mine? Meaning, will you help me find someone that could help me? Or are you a power sponsor of mine? Can you help me and help me find someone to help me? And that's how I built such a huge community. That's how I built an unbelievable brand, even to me as a middle-aged mutant turtle. I can't believe, you know, people want my picture, my autograph. <laughs> they, you know, I, I'm coming from a guy who ran the most notable sports agency in the world and literally had to be interference. I went to the Ohio State Washington Rose Bowl with Warren Moon, my business partner, and he had to leave the game in halftime because, you know, he's probably MVP of the Rose Bowl, Hall of Famer. Everybody's bothering him. Yeah. So I step in front of uh, Warren as he's leaving the stadium, you know, to give him a little bit of a buffer. And the guy grabs me and he's like, oh, my God, Mr. Meltzer, I love your <laughs> videos. Can I take your picture? And War Warren's like, dude, you are perfectly famous. One person everywhere we go know who you are. And you feel good about it. Not thousands of people know who you are and bother you. So I like to be just you famous. That's the, it's the right kind of fame. Exactly. You could, you could kind of be anonymous at times, right? That's the way to go. Like tech guys I know are like this. I'm not nothing like that, but like some of the tech guys I'm friends with, like they can go to a beach and someone and they'll recognize him and say, oh my God, it's so-and-so. But if you go to like most places, they don't know who he is, a restaurant for the, exactly. most, for the most part. That's the, that's the way to go. Uh, before we leave, I wanted to ask you one more story if you can share. I thought it was a great story. It was about your father giving you a gift and it was a jacket. So if you could tell that to my audience, that's, that's a great story. Yeah. So, you know, th there's three red flags that I was going to lose everything. And my father left when I was five. At 10 years old, he was my hero, by the way. In fact, the biggest guilt that I still have therapy over is I would sit in the back seat of that station wagon, mom working two jobs, raising six kids. My dad was a deadbeat 70s dad. He was rich married to a girl younger, closer to my age than him. He would drive, wave to me in his convertible Cadillac as I'm starving. But he was my hero until I was 10. He forgot my birthday. And it wasn't that he forgot my birthday. It was that when I approached him about forgetting my birthday, he lied to me and said, I didn't forget your birthday. I don't believe in birthdays. Even though he had celebrated my sibling's birthday, like the fact that he could just blatantly lie like I was crushed. So I hated him. And for 20 years, I stayed away from him. I got in arguments with him. You know, I, I told him he was a liar, a manipulator, cheater, overseller, back end seller, all these things. He had cheated on my mom. You know, I, I, I was so mean because I was angry. Well, when I was 30 years old, I'm living on top of the world, multimillionaire. 
I married my dream girl from the fourth grade who at sixth grade camp, my best friend, Robbie, my best friend, Robbie asked her to go steady for me at sixth grade camp. And he, <laughs> she said to him, no, tell him to ask me himself. And he yelled out in front of everyone, dude, she said no. So I got embarrassed. I threw an egg at her. I threw rocks at her. Anyway, this all attributed to the fact that I believe money by love and happiness because this girl ended up marrying me after hating me for so many years. Anyway, and she's, by the way, uh, still my dream girl and my savior. I'm the luckiest man on earth because I have this wife and these four beautiful children because of her. But I will tell you, at 30, I have my dream house, my dream girl, more money than I can even dream of. And I get a birthday present from my dad, a big box. I open the box. It's a beautiful sport coat. I immediately put it on. I'm elated. I'm filled with joy and hope and fulfillment. It fits me, which me, I start crying. My wife's like, why are you crying? I said, it fits me. Like my dad actually took the time to ask, you know, my measurements like this is, so I open it up to see if it says, you know, especially made for my son or Armani. It was beautiful. I open it up. He tore all the pockets out of the jacket. I went from joy to hate so quickly. I picked up my phone. I call my father. I'm like, dad, I got that gift. He said, oh, thank goodness. I said, why are you punishing me? He said, what are you talking about, son? I'm not punishing you. I said, you give me a gorgeous jacket that I can't wear. What are you trying to pull? What, what do you, he said, no, no, no. I gave it to you to hang in your closet, not to wear. I said, why? He said, I want you to look at it every day to remind you you're just like me. I immediately said, I'm nothing like you. You're a liar, a cheater, manipulator, overseller, back end seller. I'm nothing like you. you. Said no, you are exactly like me. You think money can buy you love and happiness. I want to remind you every day it won't. I want to remind you every day you're not going to be the richest man in the cemetery. I want to remind you every day you can't take anything with you when you're gone. I want you to wear that and be buried in that one day. And I want it to be a reminder that you're just like me. Now, I was 30 years old. I was not ready to hear it. So I told him, F you. I hate you. I'm nothing like you. You're a liar, a cheater, manipulator, overseller, back-end seller. I want nothing to do with you. Six years later, I get a second red flag. My best friend, Rob, the guy that asked my wife to go steady, I asked him to the masters to fly private, hang out with Joe Montana at the net jet party, all the back end. Curtis strange invited us to his cabins. He looked at me, said, no. I said, what do you mean you're not coming? He said, Dave, I don't like what you're doing. And I don't like who you hang out with. I want nothing to do with you. I left there crying. He said to me, I said, Rob, I'm not doing what those other guys are doing. And he said, Dave, you can lie to me. Stop lying to yourself. I'm worried about you. Two weeks later, my life would change forever. I was running the most notable sports agency in the world. So not only was I a multimillionaire, but I had access to things that billionaires couldn't even buy. All the stuff that people dreamed about doing. ESPYs, Emmys, Oscars, Grammys, uh, Super Bowl, Pro Bowl, Masters, Kentucky Derby. In the inside, right? Sidelines, locker rooms, that kind of shit. Anyway, I tell my wife I'm going to the Grammy Awards with little John, the rapper, she said, no, you're not. You're not paying attention to your family. You're not paying attention to your work and you're partying way too much. You're not going, you need to stay home. I lied to her, told her I had a business meeting, changed clothes in the car, huh. ended up coming home 5.30 in the morning from the Grammy Awards, completely wasted. I opened the door my wife says to me, I'm leaving, you are not a rock star. I said, what are you talking about? She goes, I am not happy. I said, whoa, I may not be a rock star, but I sure feel like one. She said, this isn't funny. You're going to die. That's funny. You <laughs> need to take stock. Yeah. You need to take stock in who you are and what you want to become. If you don't, you're going to end up dead and I'm leaving. I, I've had enough. And I said, what are you talking about? I hate you. Look around you. Who do you think did all this? Look at the cars, the houses, the boats, the plane. Who do you think you're talking to? And I went to bed. I woke up in the morning even more aggravated. I wasn't ready to learn my lesson. And I was about to call the lawyer to figure out how I would steal my wife's happiness, take her money, right? And I look over in the closet and there's that jacket. I still get choked up today because I remember, I don't know how it appeared. I remember thinking to myself, 
man, I do not hate my wife. I do not hate my best friend. And I especially don't hate my father. I hated myself. I'm a liar. I'm a cheater. I'm a manipulator. I'm an overseller, back end seller. And I sat down and I took stock in the four things that changed my life. The four things that my mom taught me when I was three years old, gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and effective communication or inspiration. And it changed my life. And for the past 16 years, I've been on this journey to empower other people with those four things, to empower other people to change the collective consciousness of happiness, which is why I came on this show. I appreciate this opportunity. Absolutely, Dave. And I really appreciate you sharing your story. Um, the one thing I want to ask you, and I was talking to our mutual friend, Mike, about this too. I was like, you know, I, I don't understand like he, wh why do you know why you had that desire to want to do all those things and neglect the family? And like, was it a power hungry thing? Was ego was taking off on the balance of those three the items we talk about ego, humility, and pride. Were you overwhelmed on the ego side of it at that time in your life? Yeah, I, I had a problem with worthiness, right? I was abused as a child. I always felt guilty about what I had. And I didn't feel worthy. I had imposter syndrome. And so I was always, as a middle child, I was always trying to prove myself. Everything was a comparison and a competition, which just robbed my joy. And when I learned to love myself, when I learned to love myself and to give meaning to what I wanted in my life and to stop living in FOMO, the fear of missing out, stop living in FOPO, the fear of other people's opinion, mm -hmm. when I knew what I wanted, who I could help, who could help me, how best to get it done. When I learned to prioritize my now, to play above my own feet, not with worry or complaint, but stay in the now, I learned to apply my why. I know that I am happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy. I just got to figure out what I'm doing to interfere with it. Let me ask you one final question before we go, because you talk about living in a world of more than enough, but yet you and I, right? And I feel like I've, I've, I'm at a point where I don't need any more, but I work mo for more, but I do it not so that I can have more things. I'm doing it for my kids, my future grandkids. I'm leaving a legacy for them, uh, generational wealth, so to speak, if I can. Um, that's why my purpose, I got to have purpose to do something every day. And uh, the things that I'm doing, like this show and investing in other companies and stuff, I'm helping the society, I guess, you know, in some way as well. You're creating jobs and um, you're moving technology forward and stuff like that. And uh, and with this, we share stories like this to inspire people and influence and guide them. Um, why, why are you continuing? Like, because money's important, I think. I don't think it's something that people should be ashamed of wanting to make more of, right? And I don't think it has to be like this greediness for per se. So tell us about that because like, because I'm sure that, you know, this is a conflict, right? In your head. It's like, don't let it overtake you, but you still can be motivated by it as well. Well, I'm writing a book called Reconciliation, which is the reconciliation of persistence and patience of the speed of thought and the speed of light of the two currencies, the currency of money and the currency of faith. Within the context of this reconciliation, I want to increase what already exists because I know there's a world of more than enough of infinity and limitlessness. I know that I've been given 24 hours of activity, 24 hours of activity, activity I get paid for, activity I don't get paid for. And I have the skills and the knowledge as well as the desire to create abundance. And that abundance that I can create not only empowers others to create abundance, but also assists others that aren't in a position to be abundant yet. They're living in scarcity. They're living in a world of not enough, they're just enough. And because I can amass more wealth, in order to effectuate this collective consciousness of more than enough, that I am adding on, expanding and accelerating the universe with the skills, knowledge, and desire that I'm blessed with. Knowing that my skills and knowledge are my basement, but my desire is my potential. And I can encourage others to encourage others to live to their potential through not only the four values of gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and effective communication, but I also have a new day resolution of five daily practices of knowing your what, your who, your how, your now, and applying your why. I am a weirdo in the fact that I'm extremely spiritual, but also I come from a very pragmatic background so I can articulate quantitative value to exceed what I'm asking for. I can explain things not only as a mentor, not only as a coach to bring the best out of you, but as a teacher so that people can understand what the F I'm talking about when you deal with quantum physics, metaphysics, and physics. Thanks, Dave. Um, 
right before we hop, right behind you, you, you're, I don't know, you got a cool Zoom background. Like, what's going on here? So where are you at? We didn't no, talk about this. this is my yeah, office. This is real, man. This is I my know. office. I, I have, I'm blessed. I have an office podcast studio in my conference room is here at SoFi where the Chargers and Rams play. I have a podcast studio, which you have to come join me, Jay. Absolutely. At the win in the lobby. And I just have the new Meltzer studios for my TV shows and movies in Orange County, right by Orange County Airport. So I'm blessed to have, this is my office. And guess what? It doubles as a suite during the games and concerts. So we're blessed, man. It's so amazing. So tell everybody how to find you um, because my audience may or may not be aware of you. So the ones that are not, how do you find Dave Meltzer? Uh, At David Meltzer. Email me is the best way. I answer all my emails. David at dmeltzer.com. If you forget all of that, just Google my name, David Meltzer. (laughs) I'm accessible. So find me. All right, Dave, thanks for coming on today. I really enjoyed your story and I'm sure the audience did as well. And once again, thanks again. Thank you. Talk to you soon.